Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome on. This is show number 44, and I'm very anxious and excited to get started on this one because we left off last week and beginning to look at kind of Rosati taking over both dioceses again. <laughs> we're back to one. Or we're not one. I guess we're two, but under the helm of Rosati to take but, care of two dioceses. But that didn't ha- uh, oh, last that's, long. And right. That's so, right. You uh, said that another... Right. another was was named a bishop in, in New Orleans. Right. And that gave Bishop Rosati an opportunity to really jump in to build his diocese on a wonderful foundation that Bishop de Borg had left him. Yes. What we're going to see today is we're going to see three orders of sisters who are attracted to St. Louis. Great. Uh, first, the Sisters of Charity regarding the hospital that we just talked about last time around. And then the Sisters of St. Joseph of Crandallet. Okay. And then also the Loretto Sisters coming to St. Louis. Wonderful stories on each one of those. Ooh, great. But remember last time around that, remember last time around that Bishop Rosati had met with John Melamphy, Yes. The wealthiest man in St. Louis. And um, Mr. Melanthi had agreed to build a hospital if the bishop could get some sisters to come and run the hospital. And then also agreed to give two houses to the diocese so that they could be rented out and an endowment of $600 a year would be realized from that. That would help to pay for the hospital. And then added to that, he also agreed to pay for the transportation of the sisters. So now Bishop Rosati has his homework to do. (laughs) He's got to persuade the Sisters of Charity in Emmitsburg, Maryland, to come to St. Louis. And he's got to find somebody who can be persuasive to the Sisters' Council to do that. Okay. And the man that he's going to rely on is a Sulpician in Baltimore. His name is Father Simon Brute. Now, he had come to America in 1810 after he was ordained in France. Father Brute has the added advantage of having studied medicine even before studying theology. And so he left the medical field before he became a doctor, went to the seminary, and then continued on. So when he gets to America, he's got a wonderful background in medicine, which most priests obviously don't. Right. And so he also develops a longstanding relationship with the Sisters of Charity. So what happens then is Father Brute, on behalf of Bishop Rosati, approaches the Sisters Council with a proposal. It's finally agreed that the Sisters would send four nursing sisters to St. Louis one of the four should be fluent in French because St. Louis is still, still in the 1820s is considered to be a Creole city with a, a significant uh, French population. Well, they did. And they began their trip by stagecoach, uh, making their way as uh, typical of the day to Pittsburgh and then down the Ohio up to Mississippi. They ended up being more eager to come than the St. Louisans realized. And so they actually showed up on November 5th of 1828. Bishop Rosati assumed that it would take them a year or so to, to be to, ready to get yeah, here. Yeah, and they weren't. They were there right right away. Their arrival caught everybody by surprise. <laughs> the hospital wasn't completed yet. The convent wasn't completed yet. And so the sisters were then shipped off to the Sacred Heart nuns. Okay. And so they stayed with the religious of the Sacred Heart for the next several weeks. And work was finished up on the new hospital. Interestingly enough, that hospital by 1831, so we're talking less than three years later, that hospital was too small for its services. And John Melanfi turned around and built a new, bigger hospital for the sisters. It's located on 4th and Spruce, So if you were to think where the old cathedral is today, a little bit further south and a little bit west of where the old cathedral is, is where the uh, St. Louis Hospital is. The common nickname everyone calls it is the St. Louis Melamphy Hospital because he had paid for it all. Occupying the lot was the hospital itself and then two other buildings. And one of those buildings is going to be turned into an orphanage for boys. And the sisters will be overseeing that also. And it's going to be funded by the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. This is that wonderful organization from Lyon in France that's going to be 
so helpful. Also, the sisters received property in Crondelet, which was a gift from a Dr. Fiffen, and the intention was that it would be used as a convalescing home. By 1833, the hospital was such a success, such a success that now the community had grown to 12 sisters that were bringing from the east and bringing out. It's also around that time, uh, 1832, that the sisters uh, realized that they needed more than just John Melanthe's money. They needed some other major boost, uh, Mm -hmm. a a fundraiser that would work. And so what happens is that because Melanthe Hospital was the first of its kind in Missouri, there was a bill introduced into the state legislature asking the state legislature to come up with money to support the hospital. Well, they decided, rather than take tax money, they decided instead to run a state lottery, which would raise money for the hospital. And it was determined that they would raise $10,000. So that was their intention. So here is the state of Missouri has passed legislation to set up a lottery to fund, to fund ten thousand dollars to a Catholic hospital. Uh-huh. Okay, and so that's the decision to do that. They had set up a commission, and they sold the rights of the lottery to a certain individual by the name of Mr. James S. Thomas. So Mr. Thomas was going to run the lottery itself. In the end, Thomas did not raise anywhere near ten thousand dollars, and the reason for it was that he charged massive amounts of expenses to the lottery fund. Oh. And so he walked away a very wealthy man. There you go. And the state didn't do anything about that. (laughs) They had an investigation later on, and sure, uh, yeah, they did. Okay, okay. Yeah. The investigation later on found that he had charged massive amounts of expenses to the lottery. And Father Rothensteiner says this, I quote here, the manager... The lottery offered the manager an opportunity of fraudulently realizing a great and unusual proportion of profit. But he did get away with it. You know, it's unfortunately, he didn't break any laws. And so there you have it. So he walks away rich. The sisters walk away with practically nothing. And the state of Missouri is out of lottery. What happened now is, in response to this, some of the old families of St. Louis decided to get together and do some kind of a fundraiser themselves. And so what they did was they had this thing called the Fair and Festival. And it would be set up in June of 1834. It was a festival, a soiree, where all the elite of Catholic society came dressed up in their finery, they ate, they drank, they visited with each other, and they raised over $1,500. Okay. So that was helpful. By 1833, they had lost their benefactor. John Melanthe died. And on August 30th of 1833, he was buried. The funeral was presided over by Bishop Rosati himself. And by this time, that hospital was the jewel in the crown of the city of St. Louis. It offered free medical care to the indigent. It was a home to orphan boys and a relief during the great cholera epidemic of 1832. In fact, during this 1832 pestilence, two of the sisters were uh, victims of of the Mm -hmm. cholera epidemic itself. They had, alongside of all of those sisters, they had two surgeons and three doctors who labored at the hospital gratis. Wow. they, They worked for free. Uh, This was a huge effort. And, you know, cholera, we'll talk about cholera. When we talk about the cholera epidemic of 1849, I'll go into some detail about cholera, but it's a very, very dangerous disease, and the mortality rate is quite high. Two of the sisters died uh, from this, and when the sisters in the East found out about this, they immediately dispatched three more sisters to replace them. Wow, beautiful. Heroic efforts. The Sisters of Charity, as I said, also oversaw an orphanage for boys. Orphanages are going to become important in St. Louis because of these epidemics. They're going to wipe out parents. Families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, families. The older boys would act as servers, altar servers, at the cathedral. And as many as 40 residents at any one time were in that orphanage. A little later on, an orphanage for girls was set up by the Religious of the Sacred Heart. And again, Melanthe, before he died, promised to endow, make arrangements to pay for 20 of them. 20 was overwhelmed immediately, and the religious of the Sacred Heart ended up with 40 residents. 
receiving money to pay for 20 of them, they found ways of scrimping and saving and was able to uh, care for 40. For 40, from know, that 20 that from he had down. Mother just, what a reward he, that man must have faced. <clears throat> yeah, and yeah. his son is even better. Really? And his daughters are too. That's, oh, my goodness. It's a great story. Oh, this yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, Mother Duchenne was finally convinced to leave her beloved Florissant and come down into the city to establish a new school, which is going to be the school, but then the, the orphanage will be attached to it. And uh, this new school was called Maison de Vie, City House. Oh, and, okay. And St. Louisans of, of a certain age remember uh, City House and how, how wonderful that was. However, City House did not take off well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out that Mother Duchenne, after spending a, a short time, was finally released and allowed to go back to Florissant, which she was happy to do. And that, what that did was that it revealed one of the other sisters who had come down with her turned out to be an outstanding administrator. She was good at it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was uh, Mother Thiefry. Uh, things really take off with, with that then. You know, education is something that Bishop Rosati was spending a lot of time thinking about and working on. And so you had the religious of the Sacred Heart. You had the Jesuits. But you know that at the time that he was bishop, some 3,000 children were receiving education tuition free from these Catholic schools. Three thousand. Three thousand children. Regardless of whether they were Catholic or not. Others were paying for quality education. Some were boarding with the Jesuits, the religious of the Sacred Heart, the Vincentians. Bishop Rosati then, in order to broaden out uh, education, he also invites the visitation nuns to come to St. Louis, set up a convent, and it was determined that it would be done in Kaskaskia. The people of Kaskaskia had earlier on petitioned for a resident priest. They did not have one at this time. And Rosati didn't have any to spare. Mm -hmm. So he came up with this idea instead that if the visitation sisters could set up a convent and a school there, that he would then persuade Father Cellini to come back from Italy and he would then become pastor at Prairie de Roche and would help to serve the sisters as their chaplain. And that would be every other week. Okay. And that the every other week that he would convince one of the Vincentians from Perryville to go over to offer Sunday masses. So this way they would have their priest, mm -hmm. uh, but he would be as a chaplain to, to the sisters. Okay. okay. So it would be just a blessing for the entire town. Uh, sure enough, again, the sisters seemed to be more eager to arrive than St. Louis was prepared to receive them. <laughs> in May of 1833, Mother Agnes Brent arrived with eight sisters. Sure enough, no one was prepared to receive them. And they were immediately given hospitality, this at the Menard House. Now, that's over on the east side by Prairie de Roche. Okay. It's a beautiful old mansion. The Menard family is a very old French Creole family, had been involved for a long, long time, going back to colonial times, had been involved with uh, merchandising. And, in fact, they're still around today. Okay. The, the, the Menard oh, Hardware Company. Really? Yeah. Kind of a St. Louis uh, connection to Menards? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so the sisters ended up staying at the Menard house. They didn't have a school at Kaskaskia. So what happened was there was an old Kaskaskia hotel that had been abandoned, and so Bishop Rosati sent some workers over from the barons to fix up the hotel, which then would become their convent and their school. And so Visitation Academy was now established, and it was an instant success. Mm -hmm. The sisters had 57 boarders right away, as well as 12 day students, and then 11 orphans ended up there too. And they were, they were doing great work until 1844, and then one of the the great floods of the Mississippi took place, and it destroyed the uh, the school. And so with this, uh, the Visitation Sisters transferred over to St. Louis, where they've been ever since. Okay. And Visitation Academy, of course, is still with us today. Another congregation that, that Bishop Rosati wanted very badly was the uh, Sisters of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. He had several times tried to persuade them to come. Uh, in every case, he had been unsuccessful. Uh, the sisters were not interested in leaving France. They were doing good work there. In 1836, there was a combination of happy coincidences that took place that would change all of that. Father Odin, we talked about him last mm -hmm. time around, he was sent by Bishop Rosati to Europe, a little begging tour, 
and while he was touring, he um, uh, wanted to be in contact, of course, with the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in Lyon. And he makes the acquaintance of a member of the society who is a priest. Now, most of the members of the society are lay people. But this priest is Father Charles Choliton. And he meets Father Oden. And with this, the two priests then go to the Sisters of St. Joseph and try to persuade them to send a, a community to St. Louis. At that very moment, it turns out that there is a wealthy benefactress of the sisters who is also a member of the Society of the Propagation of the Faith and her name is Madame de la Roche Jacqueline. She finds out that one of the things that Bishop Rosati is wanting to do is to establish a school for the deaf. It would be the first in Missouri. And so they all end up persuading Mother St. John Fontpon to let the sisters come over, and what Mother Fontban did was take six of her sisters and train them in the pedagogy of deaf uh-huh. education, uh-huh. you know, how to teach the deaf. And, uh, and so with this, they were then trained, and they were sent to the United States. They arrived in New Orleans in March of 1836. Bishop Rosati was so excited to get them, he actually traveled from St. Louis to New Orleans to meet them at the boat. Wow. He then accompanied the community back to St. Louis, and this time around, they had a, a convent ready for them. <laughs> the Sisters of Charity were not using that, that building that, that Dr. Fiffen had given them, and so they gave that to the Sisters of St. Joseph, and that's why we call them the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. Yeah. Well, now the sisters arrive, and of course, all of these sisters had been trained in educating the deaf but when they arrive in Crondelet, they found out that all sorts of children were coming to them. Mm-hmm. There was is the first and only school in, in Crondelet. So before that, Crondelet had no school at all. And so now all of a sudden, they find themselves with 20 children of various backgrounds that are attending their little school. But these kids can't afford tuition mm-hmm. because Crondelet is pretty pretty poor. So the parents are paying the sisters in chopped wood and food, and eventually orphans start showing up. And so now they find themselves with a bunch of orphan girls, too. And things are very, very difficult. I mean, they're just barely squeaking out a a little living. And again, here's a situation in which they were told one thing, come on over set up the school for the deaf. Now all of a sudden they're a general school with an orphanage and everything else. The city of Crondelet then, the, the trustees, become aware of the situation, and so they granted a $375 stipend for the sisters annually. Annually. <laughs> annually. Eventually, some deaf girls began attending the school also. And so Bishop Rosati then wrote to the state legislature and said, I don't know if you know this or not, but the only school for the deaf in the state of Missouri is right there in Crondelet. It would be nice if you supported it. And they did. Wonderful. Every year, the state of Missouri granted a $2,000 stipend to pay for the education, the tuition of the deaf children. Wow. And so things are up and running. The next congregation that that Bishop Rosati zeroes in on is the Sisters of Loretto. He did not even try to to recruit them to begin with. They pretty much of a Kentucky congregation. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he succeeds in doing that. In 1823, a group of sisters, a a community of sisters, came over to Perry County uh, where they set up a convent and a school. Their situation was so poor that the Sisters of Loretto always named their establishments after some place in in the New Testament. And they decided to call their convent there Bethlehem, uh, remembering that Jesus had nothing more than a stable to be born in, and that's about all they had, too. I guess we could get started a little bit about the Sisters of Loretto and how they came about, and the next time around we'll finish them up, because their story is quite remarkable, and it shows Providence working tremendously. That sounds great. Okay. So in the few minutes that we have left, let's just go ahead and say a little bit about that. Okay. As I say, it, it really is a question of providence uh, moving. We First of all, we find Father Narynx, uh-huh. okay, 
uh, who had been doing great recruiting, uh, you know, and all. But he's now pastor of a parish in Kentucky. He's riding his horse one evening as he's been heading back to his rectory, and he's thinking to himself, what Kentucky really needs were nuns, American nuns, sisters who would be able to teach American kids. Father Narynx just thinks that these European sisters, as nice as they are, just are not going to cut it in Kentucky. Okay, that, that's what's going through his mind. Okay. At that very time, and he arrives back home, there's a man and a woman who arrive at the rectory. Their name is James and Macy Dant. Okay. And they come to F- Father Narynx. They brought him a, a smoked ham and a deed to their farm, a 400-acre farm. And they told Father Narynx, look, we're getting older. We don't have any children. We've decided to move away. We're going to go to a town. If we sell the farm, we're not going to get much money out of it. We thought you could make better use of it. <laughs> so now, what's going on? In his mind, he's thinking, we need a congregation of sisters. And then all of a sudden, boom, here's a 400-acre farm. Then, the next thing is, the catalyst is going to be the vocation of a Kentucky girl. Her name is Mary Rhodes. Okay. And she comes to Father Narynx, and she proposes setting up a school in his parish and there she would live the life of a religious sister running a school for him. Now things are starting to come together. <laughs> and so he's got this farm with, with a couple cabins on it. And he goes, okay, well, you can use that. Then he turns around to the dance and says, hey, instead of leaving, why don't you stay here, take care of the farm, and help this Mary Rhodes? Okay. Well, Mary Rhodes is just an incredible example to others. And before you know it, Others start coming and joining her. And so Christina Stewart joins her. Nancy Havern comes on horseback and and joins her too. And she convinces her younger sister, Sally, to join also. So this is community. Mary's sister, Sally? Um, Or uh, or the the other girl? Yeah, Nancy's sister, sister, Sally. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then so the Dants decide they're going to stay on the farm. Mr. Dant is going to join Father Narynx in cutting up trees and building a real convent and a real school. Mrs. Dant is helping the small community with cooking and organizing all that. Uh, Father Narynx writes up a rule of life for the sisters. It's it's all happening. And so the sisters of Loretto are just, you know, all you need now are kids. And now students, uh, children Start begin coming. coming, including, of course, orphans. So the convent itself is nicknamed Loretto because of the the little house of Loretto that is believed to be the last place that the Blessed Virgin Uh lived in. And so the community then forms itself as the Sisters of Loretto at the foot of the cross. And then disaster hits. Uh A fire starts, and it burns down the convent and the school. What do they do? Let's do it again. Okay. They began cutting down more wood and began building another school and uh, uh, another convent. The sisters, the word is spreading, and there are more and more kids coming. New schools are established. Other communities are established. And then so next time around, we'll uh, take a little look at uh, the success of the Sisters of Loretto to the point that Bishop Rosati invites them into the diocese also. Oh, my goodness. This is great. Isn't it? And it's all stuff we know. You know, it's, these are all communities are, right. and schools that are with us today. That, yes, that we know very well in St. Louis. Yeah. Well, th- what another wonderful look at, at the beginnings of these orders in St. Louis <laughs> and the schools and these wonderful people. Wow, what a tremendous, tremendous start we had. And Shall we close with prayer? Okay. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Certainly. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.